She is an actress, activist, and author of the new book, What Can I Do?, which urges people to take action against climate change and join her in protest. Please welcome Jane Fonda. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me, John. So uh, there's this video that's been circulating uh, on Twitter, and it's a moment of you being interviewed in, I believe, the 70s. And you're asked by a vaguely patronizing questioner about gay rights. And he basically asks if you're being used by the gay rights movement. And then he asks, like, do you think that gay people are still discriminated against? And you have this look on your face like, are you out of your fucking mind? <laughs> <laughs> and it's clear in that moment that this is, the, I think the reason people are sharing that video is because it's a moment where you see somebody just ahead of the curve, just somebody who understands an issue with a kind of... Um, with forward thinking that a lot of other people at the time might have missed. And what I think is um, interesting is it seems like you've been able to kind of maintain that energy throughout your career, even now as you're protesting and even being arrested uh, in protesting against climate change. And then you see others who, um, you know, comics that were once legends become kind of soggy and worry about cancel culture. You see baby boomers at Trump rallies, uh, uh, desperate for some kind of restoration as to how things used to be. You seem able to stay at the front of things. What's your secret to doing that? Why is it that you haven't gotten stuck in your ways? You're learning new things. What are you doing? What's the, what's the well, trick? I, I would have answered it very differently, except you used the word soggy. And I just realized <laughs> in, in, in the, when was it? It was, it was the, 1980, I think. I made, I produced a movie called um, On Golden Pond, and, and it had my dad and Katherine Hepburn in it. And I was scared to do a backflip, and I would practice and practice and practice. Katherine Hepburn must have known I was scared. And when I finally managed to do it, I crawled up on the shore, and she'd been hiding in the bushes watching me. And she walked up to me, and she said, you taught me to respect you, Jane. You, you have to stand up to your fears or you'll get soggy. You don't want to be soggy. That's why I'm doing all this. John Lovett exposed to me the real reason. It's because of Katherine Hepburn. I don't want to be soggy because I know she's, she's looking up at me from hell and <laughs> saying, don't get soggy, Jay. Um. I didn't know I was going to get a Katherine Hepburn impression. I didn't know that that was coming. It was very, very exciting. It was, was it? A, it was a um, very good impression. That was a great impression. Clearly doesn't take a lot to excite you, John. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Did you know Ted Turner was obsessed with Gone with the Wind before you married him? And if so, uh, um, do you why feel any way ashamed of Yeah, why, <laughs> why did I marry him? Marry him? <laughs> <laughs> um... Yes, I did. And I thought that it was kind of strange and charming. I mean, truly, he, he was obsessed. Mm -hmm. um, he purchased two million acres of land because in Gone with the Wind, Scarlett's father says to her, Scarlett, it's the land. It's the only thing that matters because it's the only thing that lasts. So that's why he bought all this land. And that famous portrait of Lily, of, of, Vivian Lee as Scarlet that hung in the in the living room and Colat Gable eventually threw a glass at it. There must have been two two of them because one got shattered. Mm -hmm. Ted owns the other one. It's hanging in the living room of one of his homes. <laughs> and I, he looks, I will say he looks kind of <laughs> like Rhett Butler. <laughs> I mean, maybe, 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 maybe if you squint and have a bit of a fantasy, you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I do both. I squint and I have fantasy. So. <laughs> I mean, I gotta say, I I don't know, I don't know. I barely give permission to gay men to be a, to be obsessed with Scarlett O'Hara because of the fashion. But if he loves Gone with the Wind and it's not about the fashion, that makes me very concerned. Makes it's me very concerned. It's about land. It's about land. It's about land. You you have these famous marriages, uh, uh, these big, larger than life personas. Uh, 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 I'm currently engaged to uh, Ronan Farrow. He's a pretty big persona. Any oh, tips for what we right. should do after we, every any tips for what we should do after we get divorced? I have a crush on him. You do? You have a crush oh on Ronan? Oh my God, he is the most adorable human being. Yeah, he's, he's also he's a very, very good handsome. writer. He's, he is a great writer and a brave writer. 
Yeah, I remember on... watching him interview Chelsea Handler uh, at the uh, 92nd Street Y. I was with mm -hmm. a friend and, and I kept saying to her, who does he look like? No, but who does he look like? I'm not going to say it out loud on the show, should I? I shouldn't mm -hmm. say. Mia Farrow. He looks like Mia Farrow. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> say hello <laughs> for me. We, we've spoken. I will. Before, I, I will think. say hello to him. I will say hello Actually, to him. Actually, we've met. We met that have, night after he finished yes, the interview. Yes, he mentioned that. That he mentioned that you had met. Yeah. He mentioned that you had met. The... um. You know, so one other thing that that you were you have been an activist throughout your entire career. It does seem like there's been this change, which is that you faced a lot of blowback for being an activist. You faced a lot of heat for being an activist. Now there's a little bit of like activism chic, like it's cool to be an activist. It's cool to be involved. Do you think that that's a good thing? Do you think that's true? Do you think that there has been a change in, in the way sort of public facing people like yourself are treated when they get involved in politics? Um, yeah, I just think, you know, when you hit bottom, everybody knows you got to go to AA or something. You have to start going to a program. Mm -hmm. And so in the, in the global, in the, in the new world reality, activists are just working the program. I mean, we got to get out of this. We got, and hopefully we got to get it out of it alive on a planet that is somewhat healthy and it's not going to happen unless everybody, all hands on deck gets involved. And then that includes celebrities and plumbers and dentists and lawyers and everybody has to has to get involved. And I think that, you know, except for really sick people, um, there's more understanding now of why civilians have to rise up and take matters into their own hands. Plus this, social media. Yeah. This, this makes a huge amount of difference. And it's not just that it's much easier to organize a demonstration because you can you know spread the word real fast it's it's easier with social media to try different messages you can try out your messages and get feedback so much faster about what works you know in the old days it'd take a few years to find out that wasn't the right message <laughs> you know so that makes a difference too what have you learned in coming out with this book about climate, what have the lessons been so far now that you sort of put this book out there about your climate activism, about trying other people to get, trying to get other people involved in the fight? Sort of what have you taken away from, what have you learned as a climate activist in the years since you've been sort of taking this on as your main focus? The, the, Yale, the Yale project on climate communication says there are 23 million Americans who know there's a climate crisis, know it's caused by people, human beings, but they haven't done anything about it because nobody's asked. So our goal, when I say our, me and Greenpeace, me and Annie Leonard, who is the director of Greenpeace, we were aiming to reach the great unasked, asking them to do something that they maybe had never done before, come to a rally, engage in civil disobedience, and risk getting arrested. We weren't sure it would work, but it did. They came from all over the country and some, some came back two, three times. I would ask them, have you ever done this before? They hadn't. I would ask them how it made them feel to do something they'd never done before, having Ziploc handcuffs put on them and get taken away by the police, losing control. And they said it was, you know, they used words like I'm transformed. And I <laughs> think that it's, when you put your whole self, your whole body being on line with your values, something we don't do often, it's extremely empowering. It's weird. Even though you're giving up your power to the police, it's very empowering. And it, it wakes you up. It makes you up. You know, I don't know. You just change as a person. It happened to my celebrity friends and it happened to everybody that came that I, that I spoke to. So that's what I learned is that we'd hit something, we'd hit a nerve that was important because what we have to do is rouse the 23 million people, that sleeping tiger in the United States. It's the numbers of people. We have the smarts, we have the money, we have the technology, we have the science, we know what to do. We have everything we need. We just need people power. So that was our goal is to start getting people. And then I wrote the book because people wanted to start doing fire drill Fridays where they live. This was before the pandemic. So I thought if we write a book, 
then that will give them some, I don't know, it's a, it's, it's a good organizing tool and it's really informative and tells people what they can do. Um, and then we were going to tour the country before the election and get out the climate vote and then COVID happened. So yeah. we do fire drill Fridays now virtually. And uh, since July, we've had 4 million people following us. So we're That's pretty amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. The, it's, um, you know, the other person we're talking to during in this episode is uh, Varshini Prakash, who is this young founder of the Sunrise Movement. Uh, have you found that as you've taken on this issue that you've been like, like, look, you know, I've, I've, I read a bunch of interviews you get. You always, you're constantly saying in interviews that you're 83. You're constantly saying your age. You're just going to say like, I am 83 and I am going to do this and you're going to own it. Yeah. Uh, how does it, how has it been to be, uh, you know, in your eighties and taking on that issue that connects with so many of the youngest people that are being activists in our, in our cult, in our society, what have you learned from just connecting with this youngest generation? that older people have to wake up. I mean, I, I was I was gonna say, we're responsible for what's happened, but we're not responsible. The fossil fuel fuel industry is responsible. They knew what they were doing 40, 50 years ago, and they did it anyway, and they lied to us, and they're killing us. And the young, it's the young people's future that we've put in danger, and they're scared, and they're angry, and they're, and they're, and they're, they're carrying grief they're mourning what's been lost and what will continue birds are f falling out of the sky here in the west coast and the southwest dying dropping from the sky birds i mean our our sky is orange it's it's florida's underwater i mean it's you know young people understand what's at risk they're giving up careers to fight the climate crisis. And they're saying, we can't vote. Where are you guys? Come on. <laughs> and so, yeah, I've been delivered about saying how old I am, first of all, because it's no secret. Everybody else, <laughs> I might as well say it before you do. But also because I want people to say, well, geez, if her at 82 years, if she can do it, I can do it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Jane, thank you so much for your time. Now, I asked before we started if you would uh, uh, help me do something, which is that now I haven't been able to see my mother for a while because of COVID. And you graciously agreed to just give her a call and surprise her because she's a huge fan. So uh, can we call my mother and surprise her? Okay. What's her name? Her name is Fran. Fran. Are you close to her? Yeah. Good. My mom and I are close, yeah. Oh, good. I guess we didn't get, uh, I guess we we didn't didn't get, get my mom. Mother. Huh? Well, Here, you rub it in, gonna, man. Let her I'm know what she missed. I'm gonna. I'm calling her right now. I'm calling her on my phone. Okay. It's not. She's not answering. We missed it. We tried. We tried. Uh, Jane Fonda. Thank Mom, you so. Hi. I tried to call. I did my best. So did John. We'll do it one day. But I'm sorry we missed it today. I, I wanted she, uh, to thank you for giving birth to such a wonderful son. You must be so proud of him. And how are you doing? Uh-huh. Okay. Are you wearing your mask? Good. All right. I'll talk to you soon again. That was incredible. We got a Catherine Hepburn impression. Full-on, one-sided conversation with my mother, Jane Fonda. What a legend. What an icon. What a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you, John. It's been a pleasure.